And this just might take a minute to get started here. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is Caroline from the Ellsworth Public Library. I'm the Youth Services and Programming Director here, and I'm very excited to bring us um, Dave Michelson tonight, who is a retired UW-Madison professor in geology. And it will be a nice night to talk about Wisconsin's glacial landscape since we are um, had quite a warm day here in northern Wisconsin. So I will let you take it away, Dave. All right. Thanks, Caroline. So we're going to look at quite a few slides over the next 45 to 50 minutes, and uh, hopefully there'll be Time for questions at the end, try to jot them down or uh, put them into uh, Zoom and we'll get to them at the end. So if you have been in Wisconsin, um, not right there in Ellsworth, but a little farther north or farther east, uh, 20,000 years ago, this is a scene you might have seen. It's a uh, ice sheet going off in the distance and the ice sheet was huge. Uh, there was certainly water in the summertime, liquid water, but otherwise in the wintertime, and probably for nine, ten months of the year, everything would have been frozen. So that's what we're going to concentrate on is the Ice Age. But um, but we're going to step back and try to look at things much earlier for a short time here. About three billion years ago, uh, there was a large mountain range that came across central and northern Wisconsin, as big as the Himalayas are today. So it was huge, nothing like our landscape today. And those, that event uh, was responsible for the oldest rocks that we have in Wisconsin. They're about 3.2 billion years old. Uh, and they, uh, well, I'll show you in a map in a minute uh, where those are. Those rock, oldest rocks are down in some of these river valleys, and there are some even somewhat older in Minnesota. Uh, but all of the area of green here is what are called Precambrian rocks. Uh, and I'll, I'll be talking about those for a couple minutes, and then we'll go to the younger rocks, which are the Cambrian Ordovician rocks that are in southern Wisconsin and that are over here uh, under uh, Pierce County. We had a period of volcanic activity. Uh, this isn't the high mountains. By that time, they had mostly eroded away. Uh, and yet we had a string of volcanoes across central Wisconsin. Uh, and those volcanic rocks include what's called the Montello granite uh, and the rhyolite. And those are uh, not nearly as old. So the oldest rocks here were 3.2 billion years. Uh, these rocks in central part of the state are about 1.75 billion. Still old, uh, still what we call Precambrian, uh, but um, but a little bit younger, or actually quite a bit younger. Uh, and the next series of rocks that we see were deposited uh, in the trop in the uh, a tropical sea that covered all of this area, uh, and they're exposed, particularly in the Baraboo Hills uh, and in uh, the Blue Hills up here, and in a few other places. And that's the main one that we have down in southern Wisconsin is the Baraboo Quartzite. Uh, but there are other quartzites uh, in the state uh, and over into Minnesota that are of that age. Uh, these are sedimentary. So these nothing to do with volcanoes. These were deposited on a shallow sea bottom. Uh, and we know that because there are features like ripple marks. These are on the quartzite at Devil's Lake. And here you see them at the bottom of Devil's Lake in sand, modern ones. So we know that this was, was deposited in a shallow sea. 
And the remnants of those quartzites cover big area. Uh, there's a huge area out here in South Dakota. There it's called the Sioux Quartzite, but it's basically the same we have down here at Baraboo. Uh, same the, with the Barron Quartzite up in uh, northern Wisconsin. And there are a couple of other little places where they poke out here near Waterloo and so on. So all ocean deposited, all about the same age, about 1.7 billion years old. And then a big period of time missing, we jumped to about 1.1 million years when we have what's called rifting and volcanoes again. Now rifting is when continents split apart. Uh, there are rifts in North Africa today, which are formed fairly recently as continental plates move around. Uh, sometimes they push together and create a mountain range. Sometimes they pull apart and create uh, what's called a rift, a split in the earth. And sometimes we then have volcanoes that occur associated with that rifting, that splitting of the earth's crust. So as the continental crust starts to break apart, uh, basically if it keeps going, it would create an ocean basin here. But in the case of the one in Northern Wisconsin and farther west in the Midwest, uh, it didn't keep going. It started and we had some volcanic activity, some faulting uh, and so on, but then uh, it stopped splitting apart. But this is what's called the rift. It comes all the way down through into Kansas, underneath younger rocks, so you don't could see it at the surface. Uh, the only thing you can see at the surface is some of these rocks right up along Lake Superior. Uh, and then down into northern Wisconsin a little bit here. But otherwise, these are all covered by younger rocks. All right, then we have another long period, um, 500 million years missing. There's no record in Wisconsin uh, between the, that volcanic activity and then the ocean coming in again about 540 million years ago. Okay, so all these other rocks that I mentioned, those are all called Precambrian. They're grouped together because they're old, old. And then the youngest rocks that we have are these sandstone and limestone deposited in ocean basins uh, uh, over a period of about 100 million years, 540 to 450 million years ago. Then we go a long time until we get glaciers coming in uh, to this area, uh, probably about a million years ago, and the main glaciation about 30,000 to 12,000 years ago. So there's big pieces of time missing. You can sort of think of this as a book with lots of pages ripped out, uh, big pieces of time missing. And so geologists have to basically put the story together by looking at the sequence of rocks in different areas, because in different areas, there are gonna be different periods of time missing. Uh, and so that's the way, basically, on a continental basis, uh, geologists work to piece together uh, geologic history. So at the beginning of this, uh, what's called Paleozoic time, uh, the, 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 of about 500 million years old, uh, it's, the first period is called the Cambrian. And at that time, the state of what's now it, the state of Wisconsin, of course, the state wasn't here as a state then, the state was below the equator, about 15 degrees below the equator. And the orientation of Wisconsin was basically 90 degrees to the east. In other words, what points north now, northern Wisconsin, was pointing to the east at that time. And through time then, you can see the numbers here getting smaller and smaller. Those are years, uh, millions of years, or sorry, hundreds of millions of years, uh, down to present day, which would be right up here, where Wisconsin is about halfway between 30 and 60 degrees north latitude, 45 degrees comes right across Wisconsin, uh, and uh, north faces north. All that is happening as the whole continent, the whole North American block of, of continent was moving. So obviously Wisconsin wasn't floating out here like an island. 
This is surrounded by the rest of the North American continent. But we've seen big changes uh, through this time. And uh, we'll just quickly talk about some of those. So in the Paleozoic, so after 550 million years ago, uh, we had shallow seas come in. Uh, and one primary deposit is sandstone. Sand grains that were deposited on the ocean basin and then partly cemented together, uh, sometimes well cemented, sometimes very loosely cemented. But this is a very common rock, sandstone, and it's called a sedimentary rock. It was deposited as sediment on the ocean bottom, nothing to do with volcanoes or uh, that kind of thing. By this time, we had fossils. The state fossil is a trilobite, uh, and trilobites were very common on the sea bottom at that time, based on the fossil record, all different kinds of sizes and shapes, but not a whole lot of variety of, diff a lot of other things had not evolved. Uh, we can find pieces of trilobites commonly in Wisconsin. This happens to be from up near Eau Claire, uh, but wherever you can find the Cambrian sandstone, there's a chance that you can also find pieces of trilobites. They're not very well preserved. They're almost all broken up. Probably there was enough wave action so that they didn't remain uh, whole. Another feature that we see in these Cambrian rocks are worm tubes. So there were clearly worms burrowing into the sand on the sea bottom. Uh, and in places where they, they you know, pass sand through their body, just like they do today, uh, and poop out sand, a lot of it, and the sand is better cemented. Uh, so the, ton the tubes that the worms were in uh, tend to stand up on a weathered surface. So they haven't broken, the sand grains haven't broken apart as they did in between those worm tubes. Uh, and again, these are pretty common in the Cambrian sandstone. The other rock type that we have in Wisconsin, sedimentary rock again, is limestone or dolomite. I use those terms interchangeably, uh, and I, I guess I'll commonly use dolomite, but that's calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate. So those are, are chemical precipitates. They're not sand, they're deposited as sand. They were being deposited by typically animals or plants in the ocean that were fixing ca calcium carbonate and then when the plant or organism died, the calcium carbonate floats to the bottom and accumulates. So that's what produces lime or limestone or dolomite. Uh, and this is the next geologic period after the Cambrian, the Ordovician. And the Cambrian rocks here are in gray, and then the Ordovician rocks are in this light blue. And then there are younger ones to the uh, east. By the Ordovician, we started to have a lot of different organisms. So there are still some trilobites, but there are also these big mollusks. Uh, there's a trilobite, sponges, uh, and just a whole variety of other things uh, that weren't there in the Cambrian. And when we get to the younger part of that Ordovician, those Ordovician rocks, we get a lot of uh, things that look like clam shells. Uh, they're actually called brachiopods. They're not related directly to clams, but they're bivalve. They have two shells that could open and shut just like a clam does. Uh, and so these are very common in Southwest Wisconsin, particularly, and especially in Iowa. Uh, you get lots of rocks that have these brachiopods and other things. So just to bring that home a little bit, uh, here we are over in uh, Western Wisconsin, Pierce County is here, the Red Star here is Ellsworth. Uh, and these pillars are these sedimentary rocks. So the yellowish orange here is sandstone of Cambrian age. So that's where you'd find trilobites. Uh, and there are some, I've seen places along the interstate even where uh, there you can see pieces of trilobite. And then the brighter colors, the blue uh, is limestone. Uh, and then the next one up is sandstone again. And the next one up is more limestone. So the rocks that are right here around Pierce County are sedimentary rocks deposited in the ocean basin uh, between about 550 uh, million years ago 
to about 470 or so million years ago. And it's just sandstone in the yellow and the, and the dark green here, or limestone and the blue and the light green. So that's the bedrock geology, uh, but we really want to concentrate on what happened with glaciers. And that's really going to be most of the rest of the story. The ice came, the last glacier came into Wisconsin about 30,000 years ago. Uh, it didn't get to Pierce County. It stayed north of Pierce County and east of Pierce County. But as you'll see in a minute, there was older glaciation that did get into Pierce County. But the last big glaciation, the one that the, uh, created the landforms that the Ice Age Trail follows and so on, uh, what we normally think of as glaciated Wisconsin, uh, looked like this about 30,000 years ago, very cold conditions, tundra, uh, just like parts of the North Slope or like the part of the Antarctic today. So very cold, uh, hardly any vegetation, maybe some lichens, maybe some scattered grasses and so on. But we have no good evidence of organic material like trees or anything like that at that time. It was too cold. Uh, the ice front where it crossed in uh, water uh, would have been a tall vertical face like this. Uh, this happens to be in Alaska, uh, but what you see down here in the foreground, that's a 21 foot boat with three people in it to give you an idea of the scale. So where the ice came into water, you get these large margins where icebergs break off uh, and these would have been common as well. So let's spend a minute just talking about how glaciers work and why they're here. We can't have a glacier uh, unless more snow falls in the winter that melts in the summer. That's required. Uh, and so when that happens, of course, snow piles up from year to year. It gets thicker. And as it gets thicker, the snow at the bottom uh, slowly turns into ice. And that ice eventually is affected by gravity and it moves. If it's on a slope like this valley glacier, then the ice and the snow on top flow down the slope and in places where we had the big ice sheet, like in Wisconsin, coming into Wisconsin, there what was driving it was the elevation difference between the top of the ice sheet, which was probably two and a half, three miles thick, down to the edge of the ice sheet where the thickness goes to zero. So there was a substantial slope of the ice surface and it's that that produces the flow of the ice. Within the glacier itself, ice itself uh, was actually moving, actually flowing. You know, we think drop an ice cube on the floor, what happens? It shatters, it's brittle. But once it's under, ice is under a thickness of about 100 feet, it changes its behavior. And it starts to behave like a sort of a plastic, a very cold molasses, uh, room temperature tar, things like that. The given time, they actually flow. The other thing that happens uh, under glaciers is the sliding taking place. So the glacier slides along its bed, along the bottom here, and commonly it's picking up rocks and soil, sand, so on, and that scrapes along, and that does the work that the glacier does. That's what's scraping the landscape and picking up material and as you'll see, it gets transferred up into the glacier, maybe on top of the glacier, and eventually that gets dropped, deposited, out at the end of the glacier. All right, and so we'll talk a little more about that process, but I, other thing I wanna point out here is that what controls the edge of the glacier, the position of it, is basically the balance between how much ice is coming in and how much melting is taking place down here because it's warmer down here than it is up here. Melting takes place and it's that balance between how much is being delivered from above and how much is melting that determines where the end is. If there's more melting, then the edge of the glacier retreats, it goes back. The glacier doesn't turn around and flow the other way, it's just the position of the edge of the glacier changes. It moves back uh, and if there is, gets cooler, or there's more ice being delivered, then the edge of the glacier advances. The edge of the glacier moves out this way. So ice advance and retreat take place because of ch changes in what's the climate on the glacier. 
how much ice is being removed or how much snow is being gained. And it's that balance that determines where the edge of the ice is. So we're gonna go in a tunnel in a glacier in Alaska. Uh, and this is not under very thick ice. It's probably 15 or 20 feet of ice overhead. Uh, and we're in a tunnel. This is the glacier. This is the bottom of clean ice. And you can see there's a sharp boundary between the clean ice and the rocks that are at the bottom of the glacier that are being carried at the bottom of the glacier. So that's what's doing the work. And we'll now go into a deeper tunnel where we don't have natural light coming in. And here we've got artificial light. Uh, and here we're looking up at the bottom of the glacier. And you notice it's not clean ice anymore. It's really debris rich ice. It's ice with rocks in it, uh, with clay, with sand, everything the glacier has been plowing along and picking up. Some of that gets frozen in to the bottom of the glacier. And so the bottom of the glacier has this very rough surface. It's sort of acting like a coarse sandpaper sliding along the land surface. And that's what does the work. That's what shapes the landscape uh, that you're gonna be seeing in some upcoming slides. Another thing it does create scratches called striations. Uh, this is a horizontal surface here. Uh, and you can see these scratches and they indicate which way the glacier was moving. Uh, and in this case, there was, this is over by Lake Michigan and it first moved this way. And then it also came in at an angle like this and produced some of these other striations. So those are fairly common. Uh, out at the end of the glacier, uh, there's still frozen debris, but we're right at the edge of the glacier now, lots of melting taking place. This is the bottom of the clean ice. And then this is the debris rich ice. You can see it's got bold, boulder sized material down to clay sized material. Uh, and of course it's melting, lots of water coming down on uh, him as well. Once the ice is out, out of that debris at the bottom, this is what's left behind. This mixture of boulders, down to clay sized particles. It's everything that was there in that debris rich layer at the bottom. Once the ice is gone, this is a material called till, T-I-L-L. -L. It's very common over glaciated uh, Wisconsin. It's especially common over the area covered by the last glaciation. Uh, there's, there is some of it in Pierce County, uh, but it's very spotty. A lot of it's been that, that uh, Glaciation is so old that most of the glacial deposits have been eroded. Uh, but this is till of the last glaciation uh, and it's distinctive mix of sand down to clay sized particles and boulders. There's lots of water around the glacier, especially when it's retreating. Uh, and that water flows away from the glacier and it erodes some of that tilt. Some of that material that was carried by the glacier gets carried by streams flowing away from the glacier and they're often full of gravel. Uh, the streams, unlike glaciers, uh, sort sizes of materials. So here you can see a stream that's got probably silt and clay in it that's getting carried way down off to the left and gravel that's being deposited, probably some sand being deposited and the boulders that were up in the, coming out of the till and the at the glacier are somewhere back upstream close to the edge of the glacier. Uh, just another one of these streams. Uh, this is where we get our sand and gravel. So sand and gravel in the Mississippi River Valley or basically all the river valleys in glaciated part of uh, the US uh, is deposited like this in streams like this flowing away from the glacier or sometimes in tunnels in the glacier, which you'll see. Uh, but it's the streams that sort out the material that make it usable as a material for asphalt, uh, for roads or for concrete for buildings, uh, that's sand and gravel that's mined. And it's economical to mine because all the fine stuff is washed out. Uh, the, the company that mines it doesn't have to wash out all the clay and other stuff that was in there. So two things then, till is this mix of all sizes. And then this is sand with pebbles in it. So this is water deposited at the bottom and this is till deposited directly by the glacier. All right, now we turn to Wisconsin and this is a view of most of Southern Wisconsin. Uh, and the arrow points to what's called the driftless area. Uh, this is something that you 
I'm sure most of you have heard of. It's, it's the area of Wisconsin that was never glaciated. Never, not just the last glaciation, it was never glaciated. Uh, and it extends up uh, along the Mississippi for quite a ways, but part of Pierce County up here was glaciated. So you're right on the boundary between glaciated and unglaciated Wisconsin, right on the boundary of the Driftless area. Here's a map with a bigger picture. The white part here shows the Driftless area uh, and the, all of this is glaciation. The last glaciation is this somewhat gray, uh, greenish gray color here. And then these other colors are older glaciations. Uh, and so the glaciation that came into uh, Pierce County and some of the area right up along the Mississippi here, uh, that glaci those glaciations are much earlier, more than 500,000 uh, years old. Probably the one that came into Pierce County was about 800 or over 800,000 years old. Whereas the glacier, the last glacier here was only about 30,000 years ago. So there's a huge difference in age. And that's why the landscape out here, uh, including in this part of Wisconsin, kind of looks like the Driftless area, but it isn't. It was glaciated and there it does have glacial till there. It's just a lot of it's been eroded away. Uh, the landscape in the Driftless area has a lot of cliffs in it like this. Uh, sandstone chimneys like this. This is from the Dells. Uh, but the big giveaway is things called erratics. This happens to be a wall in Madison, but all over the glaciated area, there's this mix of different rock types. These are in the till. These are in the glacial deposits, and they've come from different places. Uh, many in Madison came from somewhere northeast of Lake Superior. The glacier picked them up and carried them here. So a couple of these are the local bedrock, but almost all of these have been carried. They're erratics. And the characteristic of the Driftless area is there are no erratics. Oh, there were no erratics until landscape companies started dumping them there um, and now all over in the Driftless area. But, but originally there were no erratics, only local bedrock. All right, now let's move into the Ice Age a little bit more. Uh, the last glaciation is the Wisconsin glaciation. Uh, this is probably about what it looked like in North America 18,000 years ago. The glaciers actually came into Wisconsin about 30,000 years ago. Uh, but this is very late as the glaciers are starting to retreat. Uh, look at, you could have stepped onto the ice uh, here in Wisconsin, because there's Lake Michigan, there's Lake Superior. So uh, Pierce County is somewhere, sorry, right out here. It was not covered by the last glaciation, so it's outside there. Uh, and you could have gotten onto the glacier there, and you could have walked all the way over to southern Russia, all the way to the where the Atlantic Ocean, out into what's now the Atlantic Ocean, and all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So the huge mass of ice. And that volume of ice is what made sea level go down. So sea level went down about 130 feet. So much of our uh, area along the East Coast and the Gulf Coast was dry land at that time. And when the glaciers melted, then sea level rose up to where it is now. And of course, as the volume of glaciers today is getting smaller, the sea level is rising. And that will continue to rise as glaciers melt. All right, now I thought I'd give you a little bit of detail about the, the situation here. Pierce County is here, south of St. Croix County. Uh, and this boundary is a boundary of a glacier probably about 800,000 years ago that came from the Northwest. So basically out of North Dakota into Northern Minnesota and into Iowa, down into Iowa and deposited glacial deposits west eastward to this line. So this area was glaciated. This area was not ever. And what you see the, in the stipple pattern is lake sediment. This uh, glacial advance dammed up the rivers that now flow to the Mississippi. Those rivers were dammed and there were big lakes here, including in parts of uh, Pierce County. And 
those lake sediments are preserved in the valley bottom. So if you drill in most of these, any of these big river valleys, uh, there might be some sand and gravel close to the surface, but then there's thick fine grain lake sediment. And that's from these very early lakes, probably more than 800,000 years old. Now we'll do the last glaciation. And you're gonna see the glacier started about 31,000 years ago. It's advancing and retreating a little bit, warming and cooling and warming and cooling, uh, but still covering a lot of Eastern Wisconsin and Northern Wisconsin. Remember right where you are now is right over here in Ellsworth, outside the glacier boundary of the last glaciation. So by about 18,000 years ago, climate had really started to warm and the ice goes way back and then it advances down and retreats way back. So we get a lot of climate fluctuation starting at about 18,000 years ago until the ice is finally gone at 11,000. So that is not come, did not come back into Wisconsin after 11,000 years ago. Let's talk about some of the things the glacier left behind. Uh, one feature that's very prominent, uh, the Ice Age Trail follows this kind of feature around, along almost all of its path, uh, is what's called a moraine or an in-moraine. You know, remember I said that the glacier transport stuff that it picks up, boulders down to clay sized particles out to the edge. And as melting is taking place here and the glacier starts to retreat, the debris in that debris-rich layer at the bottom melts out and it gets dropped. And if the glacier sits in one place for a while, then that material piles up as it did here. So this is saying the glacier edge sat here long enough for the debris rich ice to melt out and deposit the boulders up down to clay sized particles as till. And then the glacier has retreated to where it is now. And if it continues to re retreat at a more or less constant rate, it will deposit a more or less constant thickness of till. But if it sits in one place for a while, just because of climate change, uh, then it will build a moraine. So the moraines in Wisconsin uh, really show up nicely on this map. All of these bright green uh, are end moraines or just moraines. And the glacier, when it came out of Lake Superior, uh, built the outermost moraine here was north of you, which is called the St. Croix Moraine comes into St. Croix County and then over into Minnesota. Uh, and then the edge of the glacier sweeps across the Northern Wisconsin here through Taylor County and finally over Langley County. These lobes of ice were coming out of Lake Superior. Uh, this one in particular is called the Chippewa lobe and not just because it comes into the upper Chippewa Valley, River Valley. This lobe came way down to Madison. This is called the Green Bay lobe because it comes down the Green Bay lowland. And then there was a big lobe of ice that went way down into Illinois. And that's called the Lake Michigan lobe. All right, so the landscape under the glacier was controlling how far the ice went. Up here, the glacier had to come up out of this thousand foot deep uh, Lake Superior Basin and get over the uplands here in Northern Wisconsin and Michigan, and it didn't get as far. Here, it was easier for the glacier to come down this lowland, Green Bay, Lake Winnebago lowland, and much easier to come down the Lake Michigan lowland. So it did. And so just because gravity is what's controlling the movement of the ice, the shape of the land under the glacier really controlled the shape of the edge of the glacier itself. And all of these moraines indicate some pause in the retreat of the glacier as it was disappearing. So I mentioned the Ice Age Trail. You'll see this as a red line in a number of maps. Uh, and um, there was also Congress and, uh, designated nine Ice Age scientific reserve sites in Wisconsin. Uh, one of them where we'll end the talk tonight is at Interstate Park over here on the west side in St. Croix Falls. Uh, the eastern one is up here. It's a buried forest bed called the Two Creeks Buried Forest here on the shore of Lake Michigan. Some other things you might have heard about, but certainly have heard of the Kettle Moraine, I would think. Uh, Devil's Lake uh, is one of these units and um, so on. So keep those in mind. And if you do some traveling around the state, uh, get a guide from the um, Ice Age Trail Alliance 
or buy a book uh, and learn about it. A feature that we see a lot of in moraines is kettles, kettles or kettle holes. These depressions are formed when parts of the glacier get buried by sand and gravel uh, or by fill, mostly by sand and gravel, and then later melt out. So uh, they, when it melts out, it produces a depression. Sometimes the depressions still have uh, water in them. All of our, almost all of our lakes in Wisconsin are kettles, not all, but almost all. Now, the thousands of lakes across northern Wisconsin are, are almost 100% kettles like this. So without glaciation and without these ice blocks getting buried uh, by sand and gravel and then later melting out, uh, we wouldn't have the tourist industry that we have now in northern Wisconsin. Uh, here's a kettle just melting out in Iceland. Uh, and this is a block of glacier ice that had been buried by this sand and gravel. And now the block of ice is melting out and eventually it will disappear and will be left with this depression with the water in it, and that's what's called the kettle. Here's a kettle in the kettle moraine, but they're very common in moraines all across Wisconsin, uh, sometimes water-filled, sometimes partly water-filled. Uh, this is a view of the kettles in northern Wisconsin in Langley County, north of Anago, uh, and these are deep. Uh, some of these are, you know, 100 feet deep, and the hills around here, which we call hummocks, by the way, so it was this kettles, the depressions, and hummocks of the hills in a moraine, and these may be 100 feet high. So there can be a, a fair bit of what's called relief. Uh, north of where you are, northeast of where you are, uh, there's a moraine that's just east of Eau Claire, uh, and that's what's called the Chippewa moraine. And I guess it doesn't show up as well here, but it, it comes right up along the landscape and it, it's pretty easy to follow and see. And the, there's an area, this is the Blue Hills, that's bedrock, Precambrian quartzite bedrock. Uh, but it's pretty easy to see some of these features uh, in the Ice Age Reserve site, it's called the Chippewa Moraine uh, Ice Age Reserve site. And so if you ever get up into that area, just north of Eau Claire, uh, then have a look. Uh, uh, more directly north of you, here's a moraine uh, near Cumberland. This is up in, uh, well, what is it? Barron, I guess it's Western Barron County. But here's the moraine, kettles in it. Sometimes they're elongate, sometimes they're more rounded like this. Uh, but that's where the glacier stopped and built the moraine. Out here is sand and gravel that was deposited by streams flowing away from the glacier. In the moraine itself, it's common to get this debris up on top of the glacier ice. Sometimes there are actually lakes uh, up on top of the glacier. And then as it melts out, we're left with this, these hummocks, these hills uh, with kettles in between. And sometimes there's lake sediment actually perched up in the moraine. And sometimes they're big enough so they actually have flat lake plains. They look like it's lake sediment that's flat, just like it would be in a, along the edge of a modern lake, but they're way up on the hilltop because the ice was surrounding the lake at that time. And the sediment was deposited. Once the ice underneath melted out, we're left with this flat top feature called a lake plain. Uh, and so here it is with the lake on it and the glacier ice here, or that mastodon or mammoth. Uh, and then it's gone. This is what we have today. And we have a lake plain way up and high in the landscape uh, compared to the areas that collapsed. And in some places in northern Wisconsin, this is a source of clay that's used for landfill liners and so on. Uh, it's easy to mine and accessible, uh, and that's pretty commonly used. Here's what a couple of them looks like. Look like. Um, again, this is up in, this is in Barron County, north of View. Uh, so here's a lake plain here, here's another one. Uh, here's the collapsed part of the moraine. Here's another lake plain. So this is the moraine itself. And then this is uh, later sand and gravel that was deposited as the glacier retreated. Uh, here's a view from the air. There is the ice wall lake plain. There's a kettle. Uh, so another kettle over here. Uh, but here's that. And these people, early settlers, found these pretty quickly and made those into good farmland, whereas the 
surface out here and the rest of the moraine is hummocky, it's boulder covered, uh, it's not good farm, farmland. But these are good lake sediment, fine grain lake sediment that are very productive. So when the glacier sat in Wisconsin, say 18,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, uh, and the ice obviously is flowing out toward the margin, it came out across frozen ground, very cold, permanently frozen land, maybe a couple hundred feet thick. So it was very cold when the ice advanced. And we get a series of features formed behind the edge of the glacier, outer edge of the glacier. Here's the moraine that I mentioned, that's forming out here right at the edge of the glacier. But then behind it, we sometimes find these ice wall lake plains. Uh, we get elongate hills called drumlins, uh, much longer hills called eskers. These are deposited in stream channels, whereas the drumlin is shaped by the sliding ice itself. And then other features out near the edge of the ice are called tunnel channels, and they had floods of water that broke through and came out through the moraine, uh, much like you just saw, you could see in this here. So here's a tunnel channel spewing out a big flood of water, uh, and uh, those are pretty easy to recognize as well. So drumlins are elongate hills. Uh, this is one in Jefferson County, but they're very common in the glaciated part of Wisconsin. But there are no drumlins in Illinois or Indiana, Ohio. Uh, but they are lots here, the lots in Minnesota, uh, lots in Michigan and New York State. So in the northern areas where there was that permafrost uh, is where we see the drum, drumlins. Here's another one. This is east of Madison. Uh, so in this case, the glacier was flowing from upper right to lower left and shaping the landscape. This is made up mostly of till. Uh, here in Northern Wisconsin, up by Lady Smith uh, in Russ County and over in the Taylor County, uh, here are the drumlins. Ice flow is from upper right toward lower left and then swinging around so it's going toward the uh, west here. Uh, these are all drumlins, all formed back under the ice. Sorry. All right, tunnels form under the ice with water that flows through. Uh, this is one in Alaska. This one happens to have been full of water at one time, but the water's moved off and left an empty tunnel. But sometimes those tunnels fill up uh, with sand and gravel uh, deposited by the stream. And when it does and the surrounding ice melts out, we're left with this winding uh, ridge called an esker. Uh, and again, these are fairly common in the glaciated part of Wisconsin, very common in the, in the Kettle Moraine, very common across northern Wisconsin, maybe in the Taylor County and uh, so on. There are several good sized ones. But here's the picture of what was happening. Tunnel with a river flowing under in, through it under the glacier and depositing sand and gravel. And then once the glacier is gone, that sand and gravel deposit sort of collapses on the sides but it produces a ridge. And then often the ridge is winding uh, and can go for miles. Uh, here's the top of one where the Ice Age Trail follows along the top of this esker, uh, surrounded by a kettle on this side. And actually there's another kettle over here that you don't see, uh, but that's the top of an esker. Uh, and there's some great ones that the Ice Age Trail follows. So that's this feature, esker. Uh, Sometimes, in fact, fairly commonly, eskers are actually in the tunnel channels as well. They follow the same route. So that this uh, at the mouth of a tunnel channel uh, in the uh, north central part of the state, and look at the size of the boulders that river was carrying. That was a huge river of, ice, of water that came out from underneath the ice uh, and carried these, this gravel that was this coarse. Big stuff. So that was a huge amount of water that came out of that tunnel channel. Uh, there's a tunnel channel up, this is uh, along uh, Highway 8, uh, up in, uh, hmm, gosh, the name of the county escapes me now. Uh, but basically, this is the Esker itself coming along here, and it's in the what's called the Straight Lake Tunnel Channel, this channel that's bounded by the green dashes here. All right, hopefully people are awake. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is in Red Cedar Lake, uh, up 
uh, north of uh, Eau Claire. Uh, and this is a tunnel channel. It's got a big lake in it now. Uh, and the tunnel channel spewed out sand and gravel here and deposited all of this, uh, this coarse sand and gravel. Uh, but the lake itself sits in a tunnel channel. Uh, again, the red line is the Space Age Trail. Here's a couple up near Cumberland. Uh, and uh, look at this. There's one of these tunnel channels here up, and another one here. And those come down to the moraine right here. So the ice, the water was coming out of the moraine right there. And sure enough, there's a big gravel pit uh, right where that happened because there's lots of coarse gravel there. Uh, this is the same moraine, very close to the, this is the tunnel channel. Uh, here you see a couple of ice wall lake plains in the moraine. But one thing I want to point out in this one is the, another feature that's common with uh, related to glaciation, and that is features called terraces. So this is all sand and gravel on the surface. This is deposited by streams at the front of the glacier. Uh, and yet you see there's two different levels. Here's a higher one, and then here's a lower one, and the stream itself is actually cut down into a lower surface. Well, these are called terraces. Those are abandoned uh, stream bottoms. That, that's where the river was flowing at one time, then it cut down to here, then it cut down to here. So those terraces are very common in glaciated Wisconsin. Here's an example from, from Alaska, where we're looking across the stream, the glacier is off to the left feeding this stream, but when the glacier margin edge was down here, the stream was flowing up at this level. This terrace was being formed. And then as the glacier retreated, the stream cut down to this level, made a terrace. And then the glacier continued to retreat, and then it made a lower terrace here and here. And now the modern stream is right down uh, here in what we call a floodplain next to it. So the river never gets up to these terraces anymore. Those are abandoned stream bottoms. Very common in Wisconsin. Okay, and now we're gonna kind of wrap up here by talking a little bit about what happened in the uh, Mississippi River Basin and in the Lake Superior Basin. As the glacier, of course, was retreating and uh, advancing, it finally was retreating at a point uh, where lots of water was being dammed up in Western Lake Superior. So this is the glacier over here, the shaded part. Uh, and it had a lot of water coming in from the West, a big glacial lake called Glacial Lake Agassiz, coming into here. And the present outlet of Lake Superior is here, but that was covered by ice. So the water couldn't get through there. So lake level rose in, in here uh, and it came out through this part of Minnesota down what's called the Moose Lake outlet. But the bigger outlet is this one at Brule, St. Croix. So the Brule River runs from here northward to Lake Superior and the St. Croix River starts here and runs down this way and into the Mississippi uh, eventually. Here's Interstate Park. Uh, and so this is the St. Croix River uh, coming down here. And so huge amounts of water came down here at various times because of this uh, water being dammed up and big floods of water coming over from the drainage of Lake Agassiz. This flowed across hard rock, bedrock, uh, Precambrian age rock called basalt uh, and made these big features called potholes. And uh, you'll see how big some of these are. Some of them are up to 60 feet deep and about 20 feet across. This is a fairly small one. But what you see here is it looks like something wore its way down. And that's exactly what appears to have happened. Uh, these things were formed underneath fast moving water when a huge amount of water was coming down the St. Croix and of course then into the Mississippi. Uh, and those boulders would be spinning in whirlpools and so on at the bottom of the river. Uh, they call these uh, grinders. These, this is one of them that was taken out of the pothole. Uh, and you can see it's, uh, it gets worn down as well, but that's what's wearing away those potholes. So uh, presumably you've got this fast moving river going down on top, and then there's enough current to be spinning these down into making these potholes uh, 
And the great place to see them is at Interstate Park, both sides of the river, on the Minnesota side and the Wisconsin side. Uh, and those are, of course, right up here, where at the west end of the Ice Age Trail. All right, so that ends the story uh, of glaciation in Wisconsin. By 11,000 years ago, uh, the ice was retreating rapidly, climate had warm, there were still mastodons and, and uh, so on around. There were humans. Humans were in Wisconsin, southern Wisconsin, by about 14,000 years ago. Uh, and so they were probably hunting these big mammals along the edge of the retreating glacier, along with, of course, other things that they could uh, hunt to eat as well. So I will leave you with that and uh, be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dave. Um, I really appreciate, um, appreciate it. We have some people watching and I have to apologize to our viewers because I think for some reason there is not a place to comment on YouTube. Um, but if uh -huh. anyone has a question, um, and you have a pen or pencil, I'm going to give you a number. You can text a question to me, um, and I can ask Dave for you. Um, and I'll ask a couple of, I think I'll ask a couple of questions, um, while people get a chance to, to do that. Um, but if you have a question, you can send it to 715-441-9071 if you have text, um, or you can find, um, find the Ellsworth Public Library online and um, send an email and I'll get an answer for you um, uh, later um, and get it back to you. So I will see if anyone has any questions to send in, Dave, but um, in, an, in Ellsworth, like you were talking about, um, and up here by River Falls, um, Wisconsin and Hudson, um, I know like you said, we're kind of on the, on the edge of a little bit of a drift, a driftless area or older glaciation and south of us in Maiden Rock and along the Mississippi there. Um, it does seem to be a very different landscape sometimes. Um, I drive the drive 35 down to Wabasha a lot. <laughs> so, um, so what the glacier, the glaciers, <clears throat> what am I trying to ask? Um, what would have shaped, what kind of shaped the driftless area instead uh, if the glacier, the glaciers didn't take things away or change, change the landscape? Yeah, so I would actually phrase it the other way. Um, <laughs> the, the driftless area is what the glaciated area looked like before glaciation. So the effect of the glacier was to flatten the landscape. Okay. You know, grind off the tops of hills, fill in valleys with sand and gravel deposited by streams or till deposited by the glacier. So basically, if we can, you know, we have ways now of mapping the top of the bedrock under the glacial deposits. And if you look at that, you know, the shape is actually pretty much like the driftless area. So if we hadn't had the glaciers, we would have had a very different Wisconsin. You bet. You bet. <laughs> um, do you, maybe we have some, some fossil hunters watching. Do you have um, tips or um, anything to share with fossil hunters? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I, I don't personally, I mean, I've, yeah, I'm a glacial geologist, so I've been a little interested in fossils, but that's not my ma my main thing. <laughs> but but there are certainly places, um, and I, I think the best thing to do the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey has all of their publications on the web, and so if you just put in W G N H S. That will bring up the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey website. And then you can click on publications and it gives you a bunch of choices. You can choose by area. Okay. Or you can choose by fossils or bedrock geology or glacial geology. Yeah, I mean, 
so it's, it's a pretty easy site to use. And, and there is a guide there to fossil collecting in Wisconsin. Okay. That's good to know. <laughs> um, along with our, with, along with our glacial geology up here, we have a, a county park um, and maybe, I don't know, since glaciers are more your thing, maybe you don't know as much about, um, we have a Nugget Lake and there's some different um, theories about how that, that was formed. I don't know if you know anything about that. Um, possibly a meteor or um, some other intrusion of some kind. Well, and no, uh, and yes, I've heard of it, but I don't, I just don't know enough about it to talk about. <laughs> I've heard about it. Okay. I've heard, I've heard it's debated. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's all I know. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm not seeing any other questions from people. I'm trying to think if there was something else that I thought about. Um, it's, I've always found the, found um, the glacial geology be, to be really, really interesting and that we can take the glaciers we see, because we still have glaciers on, on earth and um, use that to inform what happened a long time ago. Um, and I find that really fascinating. Yes. Um, I, I thank you for sharing all of your knowledge with us tonight. Well, it also involves, it informs what's probably going to happen in the future. Um, you know, glaciers are disappearing rapidly. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and the sea level is going to rise rapidly. Uh, and when you, I just happened to see a show in the last day or two on Florida. Florida is very low. Uh, during the last interglacial, when we didn't have glaciers last, which was, you know, about 140,000 years ago, a good part of Florida was underwater. And as the sea level continues to rise, we have more and more people moving into Florida. I heard today that there was uh, something like 900 people a day that move into Florida. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And they're going to, a lot of them are going to the coastal area. I mean, they're, the coastal area is just covered with closely spaced houses and those houses are only a few feet above sea level. So I think we got major problems coming with sea level rise. Yes. Um, is there, I don't, I'm assuming probably spent most of your your time at Madison studying Wisconsin's um, glacial geology, but are there other areas outside of Wisconsin that you think are really interesting as far as glacial geology? Or is Wisconsin the most interesting? <laughs> well, no, uh, obviously I think places where there are modern glaciers are very interesting. And in fact, I would recommend anybody that has a, even a slight interest, uh, go to Iceland. Iceland, you can see all the features that I just talked about uh, forming at the edge of the glacier. Drumlins, eskers, all those features. So if you get to Iceland and can spend a little time, a couple of weeks, but the logistics are pretty easy um, and it's not cheap, <laughs> but that's, that's where I would go if I wanted to see glacial features or glaciers in action. Okay. Well, and you also get the added bonus in Iceland that you get to see the other side of, <laughs> of geology with the, with the rift and, and kind of volcanic things. Going you got, yep. You would see <laughs> volcanic uh, activity. You'd see geysers uh, and you know, a variety of things that are, you know, at least similar to what you see in Yellowstone National Park. Very good. Well, I, um, I have not seen any any questions come in from anybody. Um, like I said, you can reach out to us here at the Ellsworth Public Library and I can maybe send Dave an email. Um, but I, I hope you um, enjoyed uh, Dave's talk as much as I did um, and we'll wish everyone a good night. So thank you very much. Okay.